everybody and welcome to the channel. In today's archive video, we have esteemed astrologer Achuta Bavadas discussing the topics of the 12 houses and where their meanings are derived from, from an astronomical point of view. So why is the fourth house connected with home and family? Why is the seventh house connected with marriages and open enemies and so on? As a reminder, we have a number of fantastic workshops coming up. We have the wonderful Maurice Fernandez discussing the magic of the eclipses on November 4th. And we also have workshops with Cameron Allen and Patricia Touchant. So if you'd like to see those, please look in the links below this video in the description. We also have a free community webinar coming up with Brittany Leclerc on the topic of crimes of passion. So if you enjoy the topics of the macabre, join us there on November 26. And without further ado, let's get into the video. I think this is one of the topics that's really um, close to my heart because I remember when I began my own studies of astrology and I, I always had that pesky question, but why, you know, but why is the third house the house of siblings or, but how do we arrive at money from the second house? What's going on that leads us to those topics? And I, I don't think that, um, I don't think as astrologers that we have it totally figured out. So today is not an attempt to, you know, give you the final answer on, on any of this. But I think it was probably about a year and a half ago, I um, stumbled upon um, a kind of hypothesis about the nature of the topics associated with the 12 houses and how they may have come to be designated in the way that they are, the, the traditional way that they were at least um, in Hellenistic astrology and, and moving through uh, medieval astrology and, and much of which is still maintained now in, in, uh, in modern astrology as well. Um, and I ran into this hypothesis and I just thought this is, this is the closest that I've ever felt that I've come to understanding is, is this a legitimate explanation for um, why the, the house topics may be what they are. Um, I can't take credit for this idea, but um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about where it comes from and how I've elaborated it in my own way. Um, <clears throat> but again, I want to just issue the kind of disclaimer at the beginning that I'd like to think of this talk, which I've given a few times, as a talk that's meant to stimulate our imaginations and um, stimulate more critical thinking about the symbolic rationale that supports or that's behind or within some of the most basic um, uh, you know, building blocks of our craft. So the houses are, you know, one of the most fundamental building blocks, but many of us don't really understand why the topics mean what they mean. So I believe that today's talk can give you a new way of thinking about why they might mean what they mean. Um, but hopefully more than that, it just stimulates more conversation and, and more, um, you know, it encourages all of us to go out into, into the astrological community and just dig in and, and uh, see what else we can discover. Um, so I, was, I, I really started getting into the work of an astrologer named Robert Schmidt a couple of years ago. Um, Robert Schmidt is uh, uh, kind of an astrological philosopher and translator, um, not as much a practicing like client-based astrologer, I would say, but someone who, um, uh, along with Robert Hand and um, Robert Zoller and Ellen Black and a whole, whole group of other astrologers that were um, gathering together and studying during the 1990s, they, they formed something called Project Hindsight. And Project Hindsight was responsible for some of the earliest translations that we have of a lot of the ancient Greek manuscripts in, into English. Um, uh, there are, were, were other translators as well, like James Holden is another translator who's, who did a lot of really good work, and there are others, but, um, but Schmidt was um, uh, sort of classically trained in Greek philosophy and brought some really original and interesting uh, takes on 
different astrological subjects as they were doing this research and translating all of these different manuscripts. Um, so one of the um, one of his sort of hypotheses, which um, he has many and uh, is very open about the fact that these are these are things that he's putting out there for the community to think about, uh, not not necessarily to have the final word on or anything. Um, but this one in particular that he put out there was about the idea that there was an underlying symbolic rationale behind the 12 houses that was derived from the interactions between the primary and secondary motions of the sky. And um, so he gave a few examples in a lecture that I heard um, listening uh, over the past couple of years to hundreds of hours worth of the lectures that were given at Project Hindsight during the 90s and first decade of 2000. And um, uh, so in one of the lectures in particular really caught my eye because he was um, he was giving this very interesting, um, uh, laying out a very interesting hypothesis that the primary motion of the sky, which we'll talk about in a, in a second, and the secondary motion of the sky and their interaction together uh, could be looked at and understood as you you know as a kind of scaffolding toward uh, the topics of the houses, and it just it was so fascinating to me and so intriguing. And I realized as I went around and you know talked to friends and colleagues and my students and things like that that really nobody, not many people had ever heard this before. So I created this talk in the hopes to just spread an interesting idea and get other people thinking about it. Um, no doubt some, you know, um, perhaps Enid or Karen or some of the other um, veterans of the astrology world will have heard some of this before, but for me it was brand new and I felt like what a good talk it would be, especially since most of my students are coming from um, maybe a more modern psychological and, and kind of Jungian um, or evolutionary background, it's uh, it's a take that is a little bit more um, Hellenistic. It, it comes, it's a little bit more traditional. It's rooted in uh, some ideas that are um, perhaps Platonic and very you know Greek um, in in origin, and um, and it's just something totally different. So that's so that's kind of where this talk comes from. Uh, the primary motion of the sky, let's talk about that first because this is, we need to understand these two motions in order to work into this entire topic. We have a lot to get through, so I'm going to try to go at a pretty fast uh, clip here. Um, so the primary motion of the sky refers to the repeating pattern of planets and stars along the ecliptic, which is the path of the sun that defines the zodiac, um, rising in the east, culminating above and then setting in the west and then sort of anti-culminating on the other side of the earth and then rising again round and round and round. So the primary motion really simply is what makes, you know, you could say it's the motion that we identify with the sun rising in the east, culminating at high noon, setting in the west, going through the underworld so to speak and coming back up again in the next morning. But all the planets and stars travel pretty close to the sun along the ecliptic which is the zodiac and so they all follow that same uniform motion round and round. That's the primary motion. The secondary motion of the sky refers to each of the planets in their own unique motions through the zodiac uh, moving against the grain of the primary motion basically in the opposite direction. So um, uh, planets uh, like Mercury and uh, and the Sun and, and any of the planets are moving through the zodiac out in space essentially in the opposite direction of the primary motion and they each have their own individual speed. Saturn moves much more slowly than Venus who moves much more quickly than Jupiter and so on and so forth. So each planet's own idiosyncratic nature, its own speed, its own uh, character is moving, um, it basically, if you were to uh, look at the way that they moved over a long period of time in the sky, it really appears as though they're moving from west to east, um, whereas the primary motion, which moves much more quickly, is carrying them every day from east to west. I'm actually going to show you, there's a lot of things in astrology that I feel like uh, you can't properly understand without a few you know, basic 
observational astronomy lessons. Um, so I'm going to give you guys that right now. Some of you may already know this, but um, so I'm, go I'm going to show you now the um, the basic primary and secondary motions. Um, you should be able to see on the screen now um, a starry night, and I've I've made it dark during the daytime, so you'll see the sun along the ecliptic. Um, but here's what happens if I uh, if I step time backwards. Um, the primary motion of the sky. I'm just going to run this forward now will take the sun from the east through the sky, culminating above, and then gradually the sun will set in the west. And you'll notice that all the stars that are along the ecliptic, all the planets, will follow the exact same pattern. So there's Ceres, Mars, Uranus, Mercury, Eris. They're all going the same exact direction. So you can see now Jupiter is rising in the east, for example, and will follow the same pattern. Jupiter will culminate above and then gradually set in the west. So that pattern is happening day in and day out. So that's pretty easy to understand. Um, now let me show you what happens if I put in, uh, let's just put in the zodiac, zodiac constellations. Let's give them names. And now let's uh, let's see what happens to Venus, um, or let's do Mars. That'll be a little bit easier. So you should be able to see Mars right there in the sky, sort of over on the left-hand side of the screen. Looks like the constellation Aries is right above him. Um, now everybody know, should know that our zodiac is a little different, so uh, because of the precession of the equinoxes, the constellations are not exactly lined up with the zodiac in, in terms of how we chart the planets. Uh, Mars is in Taurus right now, Every, everybody may know that, but um, the, so the, the, the planets are not exactly lined up with the constellations in the sky any longer. We use a sort of a fixed zodiac while the constellations are slowly moving. Anyway, so here's, here's the secondary motion. If we progress this exact uh, screen one day at a time, what you're going to see is very slowly Mars is moving to the left through Aries and now is entering Taurus. So every single day, if I come back to approximately the same time of day, you, what you should be able to see is Mars is moving to the left of the screen, which is toward the east in our sky. And yet, if you were on any given day, if you were to run time forward one hour at a time, Mars is going to move through the sky, culminate ahead, on, overhead, and then set in the west. So the primary and secondary motions of the sky are two contrary motions that are constantly interacting with one another in terms of the, the way that we uh, perceive the motions of the planets in the daily sky and as they move through the zodiac out in space. So that's just a really brief uh, a brief lesson for you guys. For those who need, I think, you know, the visual is helpful. So, all right. Basically, what Schmidt did and what I was, at first, the reason you see Lao Tzu and Heraclitus is I was going to take some time explaining the connections of several pivotal uh, philosophers in Eastern and Western thinking, Lao Tzu and Heraclitus. I was going to uh, compare and contrast their views um, to uh, those of, of Plato's views uh, on these two motions. Because it turns out that these two motions are very fundamentally linked to a number of different um, uh, perennial philosophies around the world. And, um, but I, I figured that we would not have enough time if I really wanted to get through the houses, so I, I just chopped those out. But what Schmidt argued about these two motions is that 
they were fundamental, they are fundamental to the way that the sky works and the way that our zodiac and our charts are mapped out. And so because they are so fundamental, um, he thought that it was very important to have an understanding of um, uh, you know where they come from philosophically, how they're how those two different motions are understood uh, philosophically and symbolically, uh, and and what early astrologers might have thought about those two motions, um, and Schmidt, what he did as someone who was deeply influenced by Platonic thinking, Robert Schmidt sort of compares the primary and secondary motions to um, two concepts that were really fundamental to um, Plato's uh, philosophy. So in a famous um, dialogue or, or sort of um, treatise by Plato called the Timaeus, um, Plato proposes that these primary and secondary motions in the sky that we just looked at reflect a kind of basic relationship between metaphysical concepts or, or metaphysical um, ideas. One uh, is called the same and the other is called the different, or one is called literally the one and the other is called the other. Um, another way of thinking about it, and this should probably be familiar to anyone who's had a, like an introduction to philosophy course before, is that um, the one or the same uh, is basically a, a concept related to the idea that there is a, a realm of unchanging and eternal forms. So for example, uh, let's think about the idea of a horse. If you, if, you, if you think of a horse in your head, a horse appears, right? It's a horse. It's not really a particular horse in the world materialized in a body. It's more like an ideal horse that's in your head. Um, on the other hand, uh, out in the world there are, you know, hundreds of thousands of actual horses that have a body that will live and die, that will come to be and pass away. And yet the idea of horse remains as a kind of unchanging um, archetype or, or principle or form. So this is just, I'm just giving a very rough summary of some basic uh, Platonic thinking, but uh, Plato related those concepts, the ideal, the realm of the ideal, and then the realm where the ideals are instantiated into actual material forms and they come to be and then they pass away. Um, he related those two realms to the motion of the same and the motion of the different or the primary and secondary motions of the sky, and he does this in the Timaeus. So. Uh, for example, every day the uh, sun rises in the east, culminates above, sets in the west, and all of the planets do the same thing along the ecliptic, and all of the stars along the ecliptic, and then they go, they wheel through the lower half, the other side of the earth, or the underworld, and then they come up again, and they do this over and over and over and over. So there is a sense in which this is ideal, unchanging, perfect, eternal, this eternal circular motion. On the other hand, all of the planets moving at their own speeds in their own courses, all different from one another, against the grain of that primary singular motion are reflective of the realm of coming to be and passing away, where there are many different horses that live and die compared to the one horse that sort of lives forever in a kind of untouched ideal state. So, uh, Schmidt just noted that it was very likely that the astrologers of, uh, of the Hellenistic era, when Western astrology as we know it was getting started, because the, uh, the wheel is a, um, uh, because everything in the wheel is located according to both primary and secondary motion at once. For example, you have uh, astrologers giving uh, symbolic uh, significance to a planet at the midheaven, at the top of the sky, or setting on the descendant, or rising on the ascendant. 
those are positions that the planets hold somewhere within their daily primary motion. Somewhere that the primary motion has carried them to is given symbolic significance, where the IC below the below at the very bottom of the chart. So there are different places again that a planet can be in the sky carried by the primary motion that give them great symbolic significance. But on the other hand, Schmidt noticed that you know you have great significance given to where a planet is in the zodiac, which is um, a place that the planet arrives at according to its own secondary motion, its own unique speed relative to other planets. That's why Saturn is in Sag right now, but you know Pluto is in Capricorn. They move at different speeds, they're, they're occupying different places, and there is also symbolic relevance according to what they're doing. Venus is retrograde right now. That's part of her own sort of idiosyncratic nature. That's part of the, the phase that she's in at the moment. So Schmidt just, you know, very basically noticed that these two motions were fundamental to how charts are constructed and how many different uh, areas of symbolism are, are uh, arrived at in astrology. So he also noticed that around the same time, you know, there's a, there's probably a large influence of, uh, of Platonism, among other things, happening um, around the time when astrology was being born. And in the Timaeus, Plato literally relates these two metaphysical realms of the ideal and the coming to be and passing away with these two motions in the sky. So because because it, it's likely that Platonic thinking was influencing astrology and astrology is constructed based upon the significance of both of these motions, it stands to reason that perhaps we should study the interaction of these motions in order to uh, get down to underlying symbolic rationale behind different uh, features of our theory. In particular, Schmidt was talking and, and, and what we'll be talking about are the houses. So how are the topics of the houses derived from, or how do they arise from the interaction of these two motions that the planets have and that the, the sky is sort of carrying the planets through at once? So the re again, again, the reason that you're seeing Lao Tzu and Heraclitus is because um, the idea that there are two different kinds of motions, two different kinds of forces interacting with one another, like Plato's ideal and the realm of... Uh, uh, coming to be and passing away is actually fundamental to Taoism and Confucianism. It's part of the I Ching, which is another uh, divinatory um, tool or, or uh, a divinatory system that's arising at roughly the same time that Western astrology is arising. And there's a lot of evidence that Greek thinkers well before Plato were thinking about these things like Heraclitus. So I was going to go into that more, but and so that's why you're seeing that at the top, but again, for sake of time, we'll, we'll just keep going. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what, what Schmidt sort of proposed in the most basic sense, and then um, how sort of how I have taken it forward and how I would encourage all of us to take it forward as we examine the houses for the rest of this talk. So Schmidt just noted that in Hellenistic astrology, the 12 house system was arranged around what are referred to as the four pivots, kentrons, or angular houses. This is house one, house 10, house seven, and house four the first, tenth, seventh, and fourth houses, or what are also called pivotal places, kentrons, angular houses. They're thought to act like goads, like spikes that kind of kick things into action. Um, like if you're goading, a, you're sort of goading a, a horse when you're uh, riding it, spurring it on, um, or an, a sort of an energetic epicenter, or a hinge around which something revolves. The reason that they're considered to be like that is because it's at each of these four places um, that essentially planets are swiveling and making some kind of pivotal shift in their daily primary motion. So the four pivotal places are defined by the primary motion. Um, the rising place where planets first appear from below the horizon up into the visible sky, that's the first house. 
that's associated symbolically with the first house. Then you have the tenth, which is associated loosely with the midheaven, the degree of the midheaven, though it's not identical to it, but it's associated with the place where planets are sort of um, traveling, they're arcing or, or sort of sailing across the uh, top of the sky and uh, shifting from their peak into their descent. So they're reaching a culmination point. That's the sort of 10th house and midheaven. Then you have the 7th house where planets are essentially reaching a setting point and swiveling into the underworld. They sort of, uh, they sort of um, complete the, the work of the day and shift into uh, the lower half of the chart or they sink out of sight. Then you reach the fourth house, which is another kind of pivotal point because the planet has really sort of reached the um, the bottom of the wheel or the sort of basement of its uh, daily journey, and then it will start climbing the stairs out again toward the horizon where it will rise. So um, the Kentrons were considered very powerful. Um, they were that they were privileged in terms of the the strength of planets, the prominence of planets, their power to speak as an oracle in a chart, their, the ability that a planet has to sort of say something um, uh, clearly or to say, to say something or to mark something in a powerful way was often associated with whether or not it was in an angular house. That's one way of, of sort of thinking about angular houses. Um, but what you know, what Schmidt noticed in the language is that all of the other houses have their names, the type of houses, whether you're uh, um, the eleventh house or the ninth house, which are on either side of the tenth house, or the twelfth or the second on either side of the first, the eighth or sixth on either side of the seventh, or the third or fifth on either side of the fourth. All of those other houses uh, have their names in relationship to the Kentron, to the angular house. So, for example, uh, some houses are called succedent or post-ascensional houses or places, and others are called cadent or declining places. So, uh, let me show you a little uh, demo to on my solar fire program here. Um, let's see, do I have like a drawing tool? Here we go. Okay, so you should be able to see my little highlighter on the screen right now. So for, let's just take, for example, the first house. So here's a Kentron, a sort of power center where a planet is making a pivotal shift in its daily motion. Um, its daily, the, the primary motion has carried it to a point where there's a kind of critical transformation taking place. This is a powerful spot. But what about the planets on either side? Well, it turns out that planets... Uh, places or houses on either side, if a planet is in the second or if a planet is in the twelfth, these places are named based on the relationship that they have to the angle that they are uh, flanked up against. So um, declining places or cadent places are so named because they are declining or falling away from the angle. In terms of the primary motion of the sky, this means that if we were to back the clock up a little bit, let's say we uh, let's say we back it up by an hour, we would see Gemini in the first house. But if I push it forward by an hour, well now Cancer's in the first house. So the idea is that a declining place like the twelfth is always going to be a house that was in the angle but has fallen out of it, that was in the place of power, but has declined away from it. So the primary motion of the sky carries the signs. Now we're working by whole sign houses here, by the way, just so you understand what you're looking at. The planets in the first are carried uh, into the twelfth next, right? So uh, the twelfth house has its name as a declining or cadent place, because it was in the first but has fallen out of it. Now on the other hand, the second house has the name uh, post-ascensional or succedent, uh, both of which uh, encapsulate the idea that planets in this house uh, will become the angular place next. They, will, they succeed the angle. So 
planets in the second are moving toward becoming the first by way of the primary motion. Leo, if I keep moving forward in time by a couple hours, then Leo becomes the first house. So the next sign, uh, when Cancer's in the first house, the next sign to become the first house will be the second sign, Leo. So that's why it's called a succeedant house. It, it sort of becomes the angle next. So this is true for all of the other houses. They all have their names and that the type of house that they are referred to has to do with the angle that they flank. So the 11th is called a succeedant house and it will become the 10th. The ninth house is called a cadent or declining house because it was the 10th but has fallen out and is now in this place, the ninth. The eighth is a succeedant place because it will next become the seventh. Aquarius will move down into the seventh next if we just keep rotating the wheel of the sky hour by hour. But if we look at Sagittarius down here in the sixth, well Sagittarius was the seventh but has declined away from that place of power and is now uh, in, in the sixth. It's below the horizon. Same thing with the fifth. The fifth is a uh, succeedant place, so it will become the fourth, which is an angular powerful place, whereas the third was the fourth but has fallen out and become the third. And the reason that this is, if you're having a hard time conceptualizing it, you have to remember that this theory is based on the idea uh, that each house is a sign and each sign is a house. And as the, the day goes on, as you can see, I'm just rotating it hour by hour on a whole sign house basis. Each whole sign house will become the next in order. So if you follow the moon, it goes from the eighth to seventh, the sixth to fifth, to fourth, to third, to second, to first, round and round and round. That's the primary motion carrying all the planets and signs through the sky. Uh, one and, and each sign becomes the next house in order uh, as the 24 hour day goes on. So again, uh, the going back now to the theory, you have the idea that each, each, each house derives its meaning based on its relationship to one of the pivotal or angular houses. Now, uh, what we need to do next is understand that the primary motion alone is sort of what defines the meaning of the angular houses. And then what we're going to build into is the idea that the interaction of the primary and secondary motions uh, help arrive at uh, the meanings of all of the rest of the houses as they relate to the angular houses. Well, this might not make sense at first, but it will make sense shortly if you're not there yet. So don't, don't worry if it's a little complicated at first. Let's start off with the idea that the primary motion defines the four angular houses. Primary motion, again, it carries the sun from rising to culminating to setting back down under the earth to rising again, round and round and round. All the planets and stars follow this pattern. The ascendant or place where planets first appear, the first whole sign house or the first, uh, the, the actual degree of the ascendant, if you want, where planets rise and become visible, uh, this was conceptualized as the helm or steering wheel, you could say, of the ship of life. So the first house in Hellenistic astrology um, in a 12 whole sign house system that becomes pretty well known over time is related to life, health, character, vitality, and beginnings, just to name a few. So this is the, the house that is sort of most fundamentally uh, related to the actual native, their body, their health, how they fare in life. Maybe you can do some analysis of character and temperament based on this place. Um, now, the reason for this is, again, according to this hypothesis, the reason for this would be that planets in this place are making an appearance. They are, they are uh, just as the baby appears into the world from the darkness of, of the womb, planets appear in this place in the sky from the darkness below the horizon. So it is related to birth. And because it's related to birth, it's related to the sort of, uh, the very fire and sort of essence of our health and, and being. 
So the first place holds this kind of very essential um, character in ancient astrology. Um, you know, in some ways, the entire uh, system of houses also derives a lot of its meaning from all of the rest of the house's relationships to the first house because it was considered so vital. So um, this is a place that is the joy of Mercury. Mercury you can kind of think of as the navigator of the ship perhaps or the intelligence of the, the, of the person that we're, whose life we're looking at. Um, but this place was, the, you could say that the, meaning, the meanings that we're talking about, health, character, vitality, beginnings, etc., are related to what a planet does in that place in the sky, which is it appears for the first time from the darkness below and it begins its sort of its new cycle. Uh, now the tenth place, or the MC, sort of uh, at the highest point of the chart, this place is where planets are sort of reaching a crowning achievement. They have risen to their, uh, to, to kind of an apex or a, uh, a high point. It's related to uh, actions and consequences in the visible world where everybody can see things like reputation, achievement, accomplishment, notoriety, fame, infamy. To a certain extent, vocation and calling are part of this house, though more broadly speaking, it, it, it's related to the sort of visible rank and, and merit of your actions in the world, how they manifest and what kind of fruit they bear. So, uh, and again, these are, these are this list of meanings is just sort of being derived from um, the, the way that they were talked about by Hellenistic astrologers, um, at least as far as I've understood and, and researched myself. The others may have a lot more to add. I'm just trying to give some brief summaries here. So those are the first two angular places. Let's go on. Then you have the seventh place, uh, which is the descendant opposite to the ascendant or first place. This is the next pivotal or angular place that planets travel through in the 24-hour day, and it's a place where planets set or disappear. Well, not surprisingly, Manilius talks about it, for example, as related to the end of troubles and strife. Uh, he talks about it as the consummation of affairs, which is sort of like the sum total of something. He relates it to death, but he also talks about it in relationship to celebrations, banquets, marriages, or and I am adding this in on my own, or maybe more generally speaking, any kind of total emerge, immersion or submergence into something other than ourselves. And Manilius says something similar when he says that planets in this part of the sky sort of look down upon the submerged half of the sky and sort of dive into it. So um, <clears throat> the seventh place was also a very powerful place that was related to marriage and banquets, but it was also related to worship of the gods. And I like to think of it as a place where, um, you know, people come together to, uh, uh, there's a kind of celebratory quality in the seventh house. The planets have reached the end of their toils through rising in the sky and doing, doing the long work of moving through the sky and then they finish in the seventh. So sometimes uh, you'll see endings around the descendant, but you'll also see uh, moments of commemoration or consummation, um, tying the knot. Um, and things like that. But there's a variety of topics that the seventh house is, I think, much more diverse than just relationships or marriage or business partnerships or lawsuits. Like, there's actually a lot more in there. Especially you can see this when you look at a lot of, um, this is just a side note, when you look at um, a number of different uh, celebrity musicians, um, Kurt Cobain, uh, Lady Gaga, Amy Winehouse, yeah, and other interesting celebrities, Marilyn Monroe, um, some of them have really stacked seventh houses and you're sitting there going like what was, you know, marriage so, so important to them? How does, how does the stacked seventh house say something about perhaps their fame or their notoriety? But there's, I always tell people like you don't say to somebody, well, I'm going, uh, I'm going to a concert this morning, right? You say I'm going to a concert tonight. Why do we go to concerts in the evening? It's probably the same reason that, that the, seventh house was associated with banquets and celebrations and this is the place where the sun sets. Um, there's, and it's also related to public worship of the gods. 
I think that there's something of a festival like quality to the place where planets set they they fulfill something and we celebrate something there but at any rate more on that another time uh, these give you a sense of the meanings of that angular place in general now finally the fourth place in the IC um, they both re they reflect anti-culminating points below the earth and they were related to the underworld this was called the subterraneous place by some astrologers related to the foundations of all things beginning and ending of all things rest hidden riches the underworld buried treasure family ancestry the lands uh, the land also something interesting again Manilius says is that they that there are effects that are sort of less showy but more substantively substantively supportive for example um, uh, you know the 10th house the opposite house is very um, showy in a sense it's like you know your actions and their consequences your achievements and so forth sort of visibly displayed for the world um, the, the fourth house is often less public less visible but sometimes perhaps more substantively supportive um, so that's just an interesting note that I thought I'd add in there that Manilius says in his uh, his text also related to secrets and mysteries and it sort of was traditionally a house related to things like you could say the occult even maybe uh, also things from the past um, and our parents and so forth now, there's actually a complementarity to the first seventh tenth and fourth that you can look at and all of these places are arrived at because of the what the planets are doing when they reach this point so planets in the fourth are uh, we're arriving at these topics because this is the place where the Sun for example is essentially reached its the darkest point of night now uh, it's it's the darkest point of night you know more or less when the Sun reaches this place so we are in the bowels of the Sun is like in the bowels of the underworld and the underworld has all of these different meanings associated with it okay so if you followed along that far then you have an understanding of how the primary motion of the sky and how planets behave as they go through these four angular places generate this series of topics I think most of us in modern astrology can articulate something like this we've we can say something about why the rising sign is related to planets rising or why the tenth house and career are related to planets culminating um, this makes some some kind of sense to us but when you get into the other houses that's when I think we tend to get lost it's like yeah but okay that's that makes sense but what is a planet behaving like in the third house and how does that generate the topic of siblings right that's like it to me anyway that was always much more elusive like I could even kind of generate this rationale on my own just thinking about the sky and thinking about the planets moving through different parts of the sky I could be like okay yeah the tenth house makes sense the ascendant makes sense whatever so what happens when we get to the others <clears throat> let's look at the uh, now we're going to introduce a much more uh, sort of involved uh, view of the houses that has to um, combine the primary and secondary motions at once um, I'm going to I'm gonna get rolling through these um, and then what I want to do is leave enough time for questions at the end so I'm just gonna have if people are, if there are questions that are coming through I'll have everybody just save them I'll try to get through all of this and uh, somewhat quickly and then save some room so we have some question time at the end okay so let's talk about a, a, some basic uh, topics of the second and twelfth houses which flank the first house remember that we're the argument that we're going to build is that the meanings of the second and twelfth are intimately related to the first that they have something to do with this first house because the names of the houses were related to the angles so the topics may be as well that's the hypothesis that Schmidt put forward now Schmidt gives in his talk that I heard anyway um, he gave some examples I then went and actually visited with him and his wife Ellen Black uh, in Cumberland Maryland which is not far from where I live and I asked them about this and I said I said you know I've been thinking a lot about this and I'm wondering you know if you could 
you know, sort of lay out the rationale for all the topics for me. Like, you know, tell me about the third, da 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 all this stuff. And he said, I might prefer that people just sort of think about it for themselves. I thought that was a great answer. Um, so I have some of these, some of these insights generate from Schmidt, but others of them generate from doing what Schmidt encouraged me to do, which was to think about them. So I hope that you guys will do the same, and maybe there's other, you, you know, other ways of, uh, generating these connections between the topics and um, the astronomical rationale that you'll come up with for yourselves. But at any rate, <clears throat> so let's start off with the idea that the first house is the house of health, vitality, beginnings, uh, the native's psyche to a certain extent, soul and spirit was related to this place. It's sort of the foundational uh, chart of the um, place of the zodiac. So. <clears throat> What we need to do is we need to understand how the primary and secondary motions interact around that first house in order to generate our other topics. So we said that a post-ascensional house, like the second house in this chart, a planet in this house, in the second, is going to be moving toward the first, right? the primary motion of the sky will make Sagittarius the ascending sign next. So hopefully everybody follows that. That's the primary motion. But the secondary motion has the planets going, <coughs> excuse me, in the opposite direction. So planets in Sagittarius aren't headed towards Scorpio. They're not moving with the primary mo motion in the sky towards Scorpio. Planets in Sagittarius are heading toward Capricorn. So this is what we're talking about when we say that there is an interaction between primary and secondary motion. Planets in the second house are being carried by the primary motion to become the first house, but by their secondary motion they are moving away from the first house, you might say, and toward uh, the third, or they're moving toward Capricorn from Sagittarius. So here's how Schmidt Here's basically what Schmidt proposed. He said, what if that interesting dynamic of two contrary motions at once in relationship to the topics of the first house is what gives us something like money in the second, or livelihood, or resources, or what you are in possession of, let's say, all second house topics. So how do we get there? Well, imagine for a moment that we symbolically imagine anything in the second house as something that is symbolically moving out from or away from the first house by the planet's secondary motion, but by the primary motion it will eventually be carried back to the first. Schmidt suggested, uh, for example, that this could be why we have money, because what is money? what is our livelihood or resources, if not something that goes out from us into the world, as it were, or away from us, but is returned back to us. So you get that from the primary and secondary motions combined in the second house. You have things that will be carried to the native, which is the first house, the individuals whose chart we are looking at. This is the first house. Planets in the second will be carried to the first, but by their secondary motion, they're moving out from the first. So what goes out from you but returns to you is called your substance. And this was one of the names of the second house, bios, or substance. What What is yours, what you are in possession of that will fruit or yield something, like a farmer and his field and how well the crops do, or your land and what you're able to generate from it, or livelihood and what you're able to produce or uh, what what you're able to earn. Things that go out from the native but are returned to them. So that's the basic idea and that that's going to end up repeating a similar manner of looking at primary and secondary motion around the entire wheel to generate all the rest of the topics. So that's just a, now you may have, have questions about this. I'm going to go through all of the houses now and give you a brief explanation and then hopefully leave some room for questions. So in the second, again, let me repeat that. Planets in the second by primary motion are being 
carried into the first, though by secondary motion they're moving away from it. So the idea would be that money, livelihood, and resources are subjects that all involve the same symbolic motion of moving out from the native, like energy going out from you but being returned to you. So that's the idea there. Now uh, let me <clears throat> try the twelfth. Now the twelfth house was uh, called the evil spirit or the evil daimon and it was not a great house. It was related to all manner of anguish and, and, and suffering, imprisonment, slavery, um, steering your ship into the rocks you might say, self self-destruction, uh, isolation, loneliness, the dark night of the soul, you name it. It's not an easy house. Now whether or not we, it has nothing really to do in my opinion with whether or not we, there is great value for the soul in this house. Of course there can be value for the soul in any house. There is really no, I mean, and, and plus you can have people who who often work in environments that are filled with suffering. I have a a cousin who wants to work in war-torn countries with people who, like people who are suffering from the civil, you know, the sort of civil war in Syria, for example. Though she has Mars as the ruler of her career house in the twelfth house, right? So she wants to work in war-torn countries who have been ravaged by the darkness of the human spirit. So that. I want to say that right away so that we don't get this idea that some houses are truly bad and some houses are like, oh, they're, this one's good and that one's bad. It's never that simple. The archetypes are very, are very rich and deep. Uh, but I also believe it's important to uphold the original meanings of the houses as closely as possible, um, you know, also paying attention to how they've shifted over time. But try to keep something of them intact and not just say, oh, the 12th house, you're going to be a mystic and... Um, you know, you probably ride a unicorn or something like, 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 like no, let's, let's try to keep, maintain something of the difficulties of the twelfth, but we can always mine them for spiritual value. Um, at any rate, planets in the twelfth now, right, they are being carried by primary motion away from the first, but by their secondary motion, they're moving toward the first. So imagine a planet in Libra, right? In this wheel, that is going to become the 11th house next. So it's moving away from that angle. It has fallen out of the angle, which is a powerful place that we would say planets sort of more or less desire to be because it's an empowered place. Because it's being pulled away from that, that carries one half of the meaning, but also, the planet is actively moving toward Scorpio from Libra. So the planet is said to, this is how Schmidt puts it, the planet gazes upon, looks upon the first by its secondary motion. It's moving toward Scorpio, but it is falling out of the first by its uh, primary motion. So planets in this place fall away from the first house, which is strong, even as they gaze upon it. And you have to remember the primary motion is always faster. So the planet, although it desires to move towards Scorpio, it can't move there possibly fast enough compared to the primary motion, which will sweep it along in the much faster current, you might say. So when you think about anguish, suffering, and and all manners of, of you know difficulty the dark night of the soul generally speaking could be summarized as uh, a condition where a planet gazes upon the place where the natives health and in sort of empowered foundation lies right but it's being it is it is falling away from that place so you you want to be in the place where you're empowered but you're falling away from it Planets in this place were also said to be doomed to climb, which is, you know, referring to the fact that they have to rise. They're at the very beginning of a journey that's arduous. It's a very uphill journey. But remember, all the difficulties of the twelfth house could be sort of neatly summarized as um, related to a planet that is gazing upon the place of power, the place where the native is in their body and at the steering wheel of their own life but the primary motion is carrying them away from that place. So, <clears throat> again, primary and secondary motions interacting to create the vast myriad uh, web of topics that are sort of inter, 
uh, interrelated. If you're a slave, you have fallen out of a place of personal empowerment, but you are looking toward it as uh, the symbol of freedom. Right? All of the 12th house topics are, could, could be uh, related to these, the interaction of these two motions. So um, now there are, again, like Schmidt lays out the basic way of looking at the symbolism and then just sort of says, you know, run with this. How, how can we generate the topics from this? And it seems like we can. Let's look at the 11th and the 9th around the 10th. So the 11th was called the good spirits. The Saturn was the joy of the 12th, by the, by the way. The joy of the uh, Saturn is re sort of rejoices in the 12th. Jupiter rejoices in the 11th and um, has its joy in the 11th. Jupiter, or any, any planet in the 11th house, I should say, is moving toward, it's going to become the 10th place. So that's the primary motion is carrying it into the angle where it will be at that culminating place of power. But its secondary motion is moving toward Libra, from Virgo to Libra. So <clears throat> you can see in the wheel here, I'm, we're imagining planets in the 11th, which is occupied whole sign housewise by Virgo. So planets in the 11th move toward Libra in the 12th, but the primary motion carries them into the 10th. So what we say here is because the 10th house is related to um, achievements, uh, honor, success in the world, the 11th house was related to friends, allies, benefactors, um, good spirits that sort of help us on our journey. Um, and it was related to uh, uh, things that in time would flourish and prosper, wishes, dreams for the future, things like that. Well, you might say uh, similarly that this um, this is a house that is sort of like, let's say, the tenth, again, as it relates to your actions in the world, the, the visible things, the things you're trying to build your reputation on, your ambitions, your aspirations as a... Uh, as a, as a public person, let's say. Well, those actions go out into the world and in time yield fruit. They go out into the world and in time find support from allies or people who uh, could stand to support you or help you in some way or colleagues or friends or like-minded people who, you, uh, who become assets for you in terms of the fulfillment of your dreams and goals. So all of the 11th house traditional topics of allies and benefactors, wishes and dreams for the future are sort of built on this idea that the, the more you pursue your ambitions in the world, the more they sort of go out from you and find support that eventually adds to your success or, um, or your achievements in life. And that's also probably why it was associated with the good spirit, the good daimon, and this idea of beneficial or influential forces that sort of help you along the way. But remember, this is really relative. I mean, Donald Trump has his son in the 11th house. I'm, I'm personally not a Donald Trump fan. So I would say it, it you know, these houses can benefit, you know, people of, of high character and low character alike. It's not, it, it, when we say that they benefit you, Often, we're saying nothing about whether or not your ambitions and goals in life are virtuous or not. We're just talking about the actual, um, how these houses tend to support uh, uh, the angles that they flank or how, they are, how their meanings are sort of derived from them. At any rate, <clears throat> uh, let's go on to the ninth. So in the ninth house, you have planets uh, that have by primary motion have fallen out of the tenth, right? So they are, by secondary motion, planets in Cancer will be moving toward Leo. They're gazing upon the midheaven or the tenth house, but the primary motion has carried them out and is now sending them downward. So this interaction gives us another interesting series of topics. This place was the joy of the sun, and it was uh, generally associated with things like religion, um, politics, life of uh, leisure and sort of high, high culture and things like that. Um, also associated with, um, uh, you could say, astrology itself, spiritual, spiritual matters, uh, philosophy, 
and, and again, higher education and things of that nature. There's there are other things too, but let's just keep with those for now. Um, planets in this place are gazing at the tenth or the MC, but they've fallen out of it. Well, interestingly enough, um, it, it these two motions can sort of perfectly summarize that range of topics. What is philosophy if not a gazing upon the actions and results and ambitions and activities, the very visible activities of, of humanity, um, while not exactly being caught up in them? Because in, you have to have some distance to be a true philosopher, right? To be a philosopher or a mystic, you are always in a position of reflecting upon the world. We're reflecting, if you're a political science professor, to a certain extent, you might be engaged in politics, but to another extent, you are reflecting upon the nature of politics, the political animal. You're saying, why are we here? What are we doing? Why does man do this or do that? Why, you know, the Buddhist philosopher or the Christian philosopher or any type of spiritual study, even astrology, it starts by gazing upon the most active, busy uh, intentions of human beings, all of the actions and consequences of the world that we live in, and it gazes upon them, but it's falling away from them. It's in, in that falling away from reflects the act of contemplation, the actual act of thinking and reflecting upon the world that gives us some sense of distance from it. So when they say that this house was a house of leisure, it, it's not leisure like you or I would think of as, uh, you know, like, um, you know, going to the beach or something. And maybe because this house is also related to travel and foreign places and, and long journeys and pilgrimages. But it is, it's, it, it, it's related to getting some distance from the hustle and bustle of the world where we are so wrapped up in our desires in the 10th house and our actions and our ambitions that there's not a lot of space to be separate from them and reflect upon their meaning or why we're here or the bigger questions, etc. So that moving toward the 10th while falling away from it, the gazing upon the actions of the world while falling away from it, generate the ninth house topic. So that's the idea anyway. And the sun rejoices here, you could say, because the sun is one of the quintessential planets of divination as well as philosophy and, uh, and knowledge. All right, so um, let's move into, I'm trying to speed through here so we have enough time. Uh, let's look at the eighth house. <clears throat> so the eighth house, by primary motion, will become the seventh. But by secondary motion, planets in Gemini are moving upward toward Cancer. So there is a sense of inevitability in this particular um, dynamic between primary and secondary motion in the uh, eighth house. Why? Because planets in the eighth will become the seventh. And remember, the seventh is the setting place, the place of the end of toils and, and struggles, the place where planets uh, sink. It's related to death. It's related to endings, also consummation and celebration. But if planets are inevitably moving toward this place, but they're moving away out from it, well, then you get perhaps something like the fear or anxiety of the future, because you have a planet that is, in a sense, moving away from a, a finishing line, uh, but inevitably being carried toward it. So could that be why we have the topics of death, anxiety, fear, uh, mortality, um, and all manner of uh, weakness or weakening because planets here are trying, uh, they're actively moving upward in the sky but inevitably being pulled down uh, to a place where they will eventually vanish. So you have things like um, weakness, so you also have things like uh, death and fear and anxiety of the future. But you also have in the eighth house things like penalties and debt. Well, why would you have penalties and debt? Uh, in the eighth house, I think one great explanation is because this is a place of inevitability. Again, it's a place where you may be trying to get away from some kind of conclusion by the planet's secondary motion, but the primary motion carries it toward an, an inevitable closure. Now, when you also look at the topics of a spouse's or partner's money or resources or money that it belongs to somebody else, for example, uh, shared, even perhaps shared income, 
Well, then you're just looking at the same topics of the second. You're talking about the seventh as a spouse, and you're looking at the second as that which goes out from the spouse and comes back to them, so a partner's livelihood or a partner's income or resources. So all of those to me are, um, again, I, I find such consistency in all of these. There is nothing in ancient texts that lays this out anywhere, so that's why it's a hypothesis. Schmidt is proposing this because he notices that these motions are fundamental to astrology, and he notices that nobody ever explains, none of the ancient astrologers ever really explain why the house topics come to mean what they mean. So he's, he's trying to figure it out. Okay, how about the sixth? The sixth is another difficult house. Uh, this one is uh, sort of loosely referred to as a bad fortune. Um, now we could get into a whole range of interesting topics because we have bad spirit in the twelfth and bad fortune in the sixth, good spirit in the eleventh, and eventually good fortune in the fifth. So spirit and fortune are also really important topics that relate in very interesting ways to the primary and secondary qualities also as these qualities are associated with the sun and the moon. But for now, looking at the sixth house topics, what we see is that planets in the sixth by secondary motion, like in Aries, are moving toward Taurus, but the primary motion is carrying them away from the angle. So here you have planets, imagine that all of the difficulties of the sixth house Injuries, accidents, slavery, sickness, chronic illness, um, drudgery, you know, hard labor, like all, all sorts of difficult topics, and I'm just naming a few, all related to, if we look at the interaction of these two motions again, then you get the idea of a planet in the sixth gazing upon or moving sort of fruitlessly toward the seventh, which is described as the end of toils and strife. The seventh is a place, for the most part, of happy endings. It's a place where planets uh, finish something. So if you're trying to move as a planet toward, if your secondary motion is trying to push you toward that seventh place, but the primary motion is carrying you out of it, then you're trying to reach a conclusion that's just not going to come. Think about that. Chronic work, you know, chronic illness, you want an ending to it, but it doesn't end hard work that doesn't tend to result in great recognition, um, slavery, drudgery, toil, all things where basically we would like them to end probably sooner than they do, or they simply go on and on and on. So that's, again, just a brief summary of how the primary and secondary emotions could interact here to generate a pretty consistent view of the topics associated with the sixth house traditionally. Now again, that does not mean that there is not great value in the sixth house. For example, um, I, I have my own career house signifier in the sixth with a pretty close trine to the midheaven. And uh, oftentimes planets in the sixth were thought of as perhaps favorable because they had a trine relationship to the tenth house. Well, there's plenty of people who are nurses or doctors or surgeons or social workers people who work in the midst of the suffering and bad fortune of the world, uh, you know, and they don't always, it doesn't really end. I think, my, I think of my mom, who also has some signifiers in the sixth, an intensive care nurse most of her adult life. Um, you know, my mom saw in, intense, intense suffering constantly, one patient after another. It's very sixth house. And that doesn't mean that your life somehow is nothing but suffering. I have my own career house signifier there, and my career, all of my 20s, I worked with troubled youth in mentoring programs, and then uh, I worked as a social worker with schizophrenic adults, and then I began my career as an astrologer, kind of counseling astrologer, doing all of my work by donation. So there's still, like, I would say, uh, a wide range of ways that planets can show up in the more difficult houses. For that reason, it's always my suggestion to my students that we try to keep the meanings of these houses somewhat intact. Anyway, um, let's conclude with the fifth and then I'll leave hopefully about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, the fifth house topics, you have planets that are in the fifth. By their primary motion, they're going to become the fourth. Pisces will become the fourth house next. But the planets in this house are moving away from, by secondary motion, uh, that house they're moving toward Aries. So how does that double up to give us the topics of the fifth? Well, remember the fourth is considered home. 
the resting place, foundations. Uh, it's also associated, I've, I've heard it associated with the city, the actual life of the city and the, um, the community that you live in. Not like uh, the skyscraper up in the 10th, but the actual, you know, the, the village, so to speak. Um, well, we also think of the fourth in relationship to parents. One of the classical significations of the fifth is children and pregnancy. Um, but there are others. There are ambassadors and uh, messengers related to the fifth house. Um, there are also is the uh, the parents or paternal wealth is related to uh, the fifth. And there's also a wide range of things like alehouses, taverns, creativity in the arts, performance, theater, sport, different things like that that are associated with the fifth. So kind of a wide range. But let's imagine now that planets are uh, going out from the home place, right? They're, 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 they are moving away from it by their secondary motion, but they're inevitably being drawn back to the home place. Um, this is, there's, you know, that that combination of motions is a great explanation for why we have children in pregnancy. What goes out from the parents and returns to them? Um, you know what en with the energy that sort of goes out from the the from mom and dad and returns to them that that output and return could definitely be looked at as the production or creation of children um you have to be a little symbolic with that one that maybe that feel it feels like a little bit of a stretch but i think that one actually works quite well um when i think about I mean, my wife and I have a 16-month-old daughter, so I've had more time to think about pregnancy and childbirth in my life recently. And I think a lot about uh, um, a child, in, especially in the old world, is related to, um, it's, it's kind of like an, something that grows out of your union. Um, it grows out of your home. And in the old world, it was also related literally to the sense of what you were in possession of, right? Like your children were like an extension of your own business, your own assets, your own because they would they would help, they would be um, they they would be helping you do the work of the farm, or they would be uh, taking on the business, and so on and so forth. So, and some of that might be outdated culturally, obviously, but there's still a sense in which the product of the parents is a child. Um, now, when it comes to the themes like uh, dancing and theater and recreation, I like to think of that as, well, if the resting place, the subterraneous resting place, if that's home, then what goes out from the home or resting place but returns to it? I think of that as loosely related to all the subjects of creativity and the arts, going out for dinner, having fun, going to see a sporting event. Those are things that begin from the resting place of home and eventually return to it, but add something to the actual resting quality of your life. They're things that you do for enjoyment. Now, the fifth is admittedly the house that I find the most difficult to squeeze into this entire hypothesis, but maybe you'll play with it on your own and you'll find something else. Okay, so let's do the... Uh, We'll do the um, third house last. So the third house, by primary motion, is being carried away from the fourth, but the planets, by secondary motion, gaze upon it. So planets in Capricorn are moving toward Aquarius, but the primary motion is carrying them, has carried them out of the fourth into the third, and will keep carrying them away from that angle. The third house, uh, oh, and by the way, the sixth was the joy of Mars. The fifth was the joy of Venus. Um, so there's just some fun, like, tidbits for you. And the third is the joy of the moon. So the third house is related to topics over time, like siblings. Let's start with that one. So if a planet is gazing upon the roots, where it comes from, but it is moving out from the roots, then what are siblings if not people that we share a common root with, we, the planet is gazing upon the roots, but we disseminate outward in different directions from the place that we come from. So the gazing upon the roots, but being carried out of the place of rootedness, the home, 
is sort of a good picture of siblings. But it was also related at different times. People call it the house of brethren and or like close people who are like family to you. So and friends, people that you share some common rootedness with, though you go your separate ways in the world, you'll always share some kind of root with. It's also related at different times to neighbors, people that you share a common root with, though you are also fundamentally uh, different from in some way. You're scattered around, um, scattered around a common center. Uh, it's also related to writers. At different times, not necessarily in Hellenistic astrology, but as the tradition goes on, it becomes something that's related to writers and uh, thinkers and intellectuals and, you know, people who sort of uh, the media to a certain extent and journalism and things like that. Well, <clears throat> I like to think of the third house as a house that is uh, related to things like writing and as someone with the sun and Mercury in the third, and I studied writing in grad school all of my 20s. I like to think of the third house as, you know, what, is, what do journalists do every day? What does a blogger like myself do every day? Or I wrote a memoir for my first book. What is, why would writing be there? Well, because in, in the simplest sense, the journalist and the writer gazes upon the common elements of human life. Like the journalist looks at life in the city, the community, the village, and then reflects upon that. And remember, just like the ninth house is reflecting upon the activities of the world in the tenth, the third is in a reflective position uh, in relationship to the fourth. So if you're reflecting upon the roots, the common activities or events, the everyday stuff of life, but you're being carried away from it, you're in a reflective position, a little bit of a distance position from it. I think that's a pretty good argument for writers, people in the media, people like Joan Rivers who had a stacked third house and was a beloved media and kind of everyday critic and commentator of things like people's dresses on the red carpet for the Oscars or um, a blogger like myself. Again, I wrote a memoir which is a reflection on where I came from. But you also see uh, things in the third, like um, Joan Baez, who has a couple of good planets in the third house. Well, she was known for starting the the Roots revival in folk music. It's literally called like the, the Roots movement, or Roots revival in folk music. Folk is, and Roots revival, all things that are about sharing, reflecting upon, sharing in the art of the everyday life. Now this is a, also a house that's related to religion traditionally, but usually pagan or almost more like indigenous religions. It has that kind of a flavor in my opinion and is related to the, the goddess, the moon. So at any rate, we've made it through the wheel. You have a crash course in what I usually teach in a three-hour class. Um, I hope that this was really interesting for you guys. Uh, to me, this is a, a very interesting, um, you know, hypothesis that should get us thinking. I, I don't stand in any, you know, illusion that this is the be-all, end-all. There are certainly potential holes in this theory. Um, I made this little uh, graph so that um, if anybody wants it, I don't know if Enid will have it or you could certainly email me, but you could use this graph to help you uh, continually uh, continue to conceptualize the primary and secondary motions and how they relate to each of the four angles. And perhaps you'll come up with new explanations for why certain topics are generated based on these uh, motions. But that's that's it. I want to make sure that we have some questions if there's time. I know we're almost at the end. Well, thank you. And yes, if you send me um, a copy of your presentation, I can, can put it into a handout to send to everybody with the recording. I think that would be probably very useful for them. Awesome. And we do have a couple of questions. Um, one is just a, a simple one of what was the software you used to show the sky? Was that Starry oh, Night? Starry Night, yep. Okay. And for those of you, Starry Night is a good one and Stellarium is another good one. There's a couple of them out there that you can get. Okay, the other, let's see, um, 
one question was was actually touches on some of the changes made in modern astrology. And this question, if the fourth is the darkest point, why is Scorpio and Pluto associated with the eighth, which is still in the light? Good, great question. I, I don't think it should be. I, that's just my, you know, it, perhaps it could be, but my, my personal feeling is that the original sort of mapping of the wheel, and especially this, this rationale that I've laid out today, is um, I, I think it's actually a much more useful way of conceptualizing the um, places. But more broadly, what I would say is that I, I really think that I, I really think that the, the, the mistake in again, I, I, the mistake I think that modern astrology makes with regard to the houses is to assign uh, planets and and um, zodiac signs to the houses. I think that the original mapping of the joys as well as the topics of the houses based on these motions is much um, it's much more holistic um, and I, I think that the signs just are totally they, they should be treated as a totally almost like a totally separate dimension of astrology that that the signs become the houses and move through the houses in in the in the wheel um, becoming the different houses but to lay out Aries as the first, Taurus as the second, all the way around the wheel, I, I believe that's a mistake. That's just my opinion. Well, I, I started with that in my teachings, and I found that when I finally got myself out of that pattern, it really helped interpretation. <laughs> it made it a little clearer for me. I totally agree. Uh, and actually, on that, there is a question of wondering, like, do you, in interpretation, how how do you find this working for you? Like, oh, you may in terms of reading charts for clients. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> um, yeah, really well because um, I find that when you have a, when you're when you have something that helps you to think about the houses, not just a list of topics, but an but an underlying rationale that generates a myriad of topics. You're in a better position um, to divine something that might be very, very particular, um, rather than only having a, a short list of topics available to you. For, for example, um, let's say that, and this is just a simple example, right? But let's say that uh, you know a client uh, comes to you and they say, um, you know. I've just finished, I'm thinking of a client that I had not long ago, uh, I've just finished graduate school and I have a certification, uh, an exam coming up. Um, and I'm nervous that I'm not going to pass it. And you look at their transits and you see, and this was uh, Mars retrograde last spring, summer. And Mars retrograde was moving right at about the time of the exam Mars retrograde was going to be on the descendant in this woman's chart. Because I know that that's not just a place referring to her romantic partner's lawsuits or marriage, but because I have the, the idea of the, the place where planets come to rest or they culminate or finish something, and because I know that Mars is a can be a difficult planet, and because I know eventually it's going to go back over that point, um, I can I can immediately understand my my client's fear. I can say, ah, yes. Um, well, let me tell you about this place of endings, and let me show you Mars and talk a little bit about Mars. So Mars is going to pass over this point around the time you're taking the exam, and eventually it's going to come back again. That could indeed be an, a, a little bit of an, an omen that um, you know you you know it could take a second try. Um, have you thought about studying longer, delaying it a little bit, or, uh, you know, then I mentioned the second time Maris is going to pass over in direct motion and said, you know, maybe, maybe thinking about taking a little bit longer if you feel really anxious, if you don't feel prepared. No, but I've got to get it done. I've got to get it done. Okay. Well, what happened? The client came back later in the summer and said, you were totally right. I totally bombed that exam. And it was, the exam took place right as Mars retrograde was on the descendant. And then she ended up passing it when Mars came back over. But I never would have known 
unless because before I had learned this, I never would have had a little bit deeper rationale to help me think about the transit of Mars over that point in relationship to a test. I only was thinking about it prior to learning all of this uh, from the standpoint of um, marriage and uh, partnerships and things like that. And I, I don't think I would have been able to see it in the same way. Yeah, I, I've heard a lot, well, I guess maybe not a lot, but I've heard of using the houses as the one behind is the past, then you, the current house you're in is the present, then the next one would be the future, which is working on that primary motion idea. But I love this idea of these four angles, and I'm having a number of people who are saying, yes, <laughs> this is a really interesting way to think about it. I find that too, and I'll, I'll you know, suggest again for everybody that you take this, um, because a lot of the way that I generated the rationale for you today is purely based on Schmidt kind of giving the skeleton key of saying, planets in the ninth gaze upon the tenth while falling away from it. You know, planets in the eighth, uh, move out of away from the seventh while inevitably being carried toward it. Once you have that little skeleton key, and then you just pull up like, you know, Deb Holdings, uh, the houses, and look at all the different topics that she has for the classical astrologers' uh, list of houses. You can start playing with this, and to me, that's the that's what's so exciting about it is that if we have something of how the uh, the original uh, astrologers were thinking, then I think we can be creative in how we think too, and that can open up a sort of multi-dimensional quality to the symbols. Well, and I love it brings back in the fact that all of this was based on astronomy, what you yes. see actually happening in the sky, and its relation to Earth, and and I think it's hard for us sometimes when we're no longer manually calculating charts and we can no longer see the stars for many people who live in the cities, that we, we lose that peace. This one, just watching the sun, everybody can have. <laughs> Think about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah, I, to me, um, this is exciting because I want, uh, I think exactly based, you know, similar to what you were just saying, I, I want astrology to be something that I feel, you know, in my body. And I think it's hard for us because of our programs and everything like that. So this for me was so exciting because it just helped me think about the sky more too. And I was thinking in terms of that, of the idea, okay, if your celebrations are in the seventh and you have kind of the cleanup afterwards. Right, <laughs> right. The six, and, and then, you know, the, there's the other piece of maybe if you've gotten together with your family for dinner and you've gotten all the things that are needing to do, then, then you go head out and maybe visit with neighbors or go to some other kind of a, a late night party that the fifth, perhaps, that's also part of its meaning. Mm -hmm. If anybody has questions and wants to interact more, you can always email me at nightlightastrology at gmail.com. I'd love to hear your thoughts or questions. or I, I'm, I always love to chit-chat with people, so feel free. Well, I'll throw one last one in there, and that is an interesting one of thinking about the fact that in the first house, when we're talking about like Placidus, the first house is still in the dark. And when you were contemplating this and thinking about that, was that something you looked at or thought of? <clears throat> well, um, that's a really good question. I, uh, for me, I think of the, the first house symbolically as the sign that's rising. So mm -hmm. I, I think about it, I try to th conceptualize it how I imagine that Hellenistic astrologers did, which was in, in terms of whole sign houses. So not necessarily that the, that the house is below the horizon, but rather that this sign is rising. And when you think about it, unless the clouds are really strong, pretty much most everywhere on Earth you have that hint that the sun is coming in the first that's, house. Yeah, that's, that's right. And I think it's, um, you know, there's something about the, um, about what's appearing and the, um, the connection. Schmidt makes this comment a lot that what, what appears, what appears into the visible realm is connected to the initiation of a ritual act of divination because what we're trying to do is, um, 
uh, were calling for the appearance of, of omens and signs, um, you know, and so the place where the place where whatever stars and planets are first appearing takes on the the kind of cathartic significance, the inceptional significance. So I think that there's a real there's a, a certain sense where it's rooted in astronomy, but then the astronomy becomes um, a portal to a, an entire realm of symbolism that doesn't have to be totally so literally connected to the astronomy. One person's noting that in the Thema Mundi, you have that 15 degrees, the midway point, as being important. That's cor that's yeah, that's a great point. That the planets are each placed at like the moon is at 15 Cancer in the Thema Mundi, and yeah, that's a it's a wonderful point. <laughs>